Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to be introducing Dr. Michael Stonebreaker uh, to present his uh, talk on big data disruption and the 800 pound gorilla in the corner. My name is Mingo Sanchez, and I'm a sales engineer here at Tamer. Mike is an adjunct professor at MIT CSAIL and a pioneer of databases who specializes in database management systems and data integration. In 2014, the Association for Computing Machinery awarded him the Turing Award, often known as the Nobel Prize of Computing, for his fundamental contributions to the concepts and practices underlying modern database systems, as well as their practical application through several startup companies that he founded. And without any further ado, Mike, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, Mingo. I appreciate the introduction. And I'm delighted to be here to talk to you from my home office. Like everyone else, I am sheltering in place in Boston. And I want to talk to you today about uh, big data disruption and the 800 pound gorilla in the corner. And the slides don't advance. Oh, there they go. Okay, so what's big data all about? Well, it's come to be common to talk about it as one of the three V's. So either you've got a big data problem because you've got too much of it, you've got a volume problem, that's the first V. And if you've got a volume problem, it could be because you're trying to do simple uh, SQL style analytics, or it could be you have a volume problem because you're trying to do more sophisticated analytics that are not in SQL. So we'll talk about both of those cases. Uh, you could have a big data problem because the data is coming at you too fast and you've got a velocity problem. You're trying to drink from a fire hose. So we'll talk about the second V. Uh, which is velocity. And the third V is if you're trying, if your data is coming at you from too many places and you've got a, a large number of diverse data sources to integrate. In each case, I will tell you what I think the issues are, which is what you should be aware of. And I'll also try and tell you about disruption I'm expecting uh, either now or off into the future, which is stuff that you should be worried about. And then I'm going to talk about the big gorilla in the corner, the 800 pound gorilla, which is which of these problems are hard and which ones are straightforward, i.e. which ones you should be uh, putting your best talent on. So that's what we're going to do over the course of the next hour. And here we go. So let's first talk about you've got a volume problem. And we'll talk about it in the context of two different cases. The first one is you just want to do SQL on a lot, a lot of data. I'll call that little analytics. Uh, in my opinion, this market is well addressed by the data warehouse folks. Uh, I know of 20 or so uh, production databases in the petascale range running on hundreds of nodes in production, day in, day out, uh, doing decision support on huge amounts of data. So in my opinion, uh, if you've got big volume and you've got little analytics, uh, simply run your favorite data warehouse platform. Uh, so my, I can't advance the slides. So what happens, uh, what the technology that the successful vendors are using, they all run multi-node, uh, partition your data, which, which is sharded into a collection of shards on different nodes. The successful vendors are all running column stores. Uh, think Parquet or think some, something equivalent. And they're all running parallel query processing on multi-node column stores. Uh, and that's all the data warehouse vendors. They've all converted to this architecture from whatever they had before. And the only exception is Oracle, uh, which 
and their Oracle marketing says they have a cal column store, but in fact, it's a main memory column store. It's not a not a scalable column store. So, or and Oracle does not have a multi-node solution either. So, everybody other than Oracle has roughly the same architecture, and has successful implementations in the petascale range. So, in my opinion, there's no gorilla here. Simply run one of the successful uh, data warehouse vendors. Uh, and so, the only thing I want to talk about is two disruptors that I see are looming. Uh, in, in this market. So the first disruptor, first disruptor is the cloud. So everybody is going to move their decision support stuff to the cloud sooner or later. Why is that going to happen? Well, I just want to tell you two quick vignettes. The first one who's, is from James Hamilton who's a distinguished engineer at Amazon. Uh, James claims, and I have no reason to dispute this, that he can stand up a server at 25% of your cost. So, you know, the cloud guys are wildly cheaper than you're going to be. And why is that? Well, for a starter, they're, they're running millions of nodes and you're running uh, a few thousand. Uh, the second thing is they're locating uh, their data centers in places of cheap electricity, and you're putting them on raised flooring in Boston, Massachusetts, or wherever. So just the economies of scale are worth a lot here. Second vignette is from Dave DeWitt, who until recently was the head of the Jim Gray Systems Lab for Microsoft. So as of a couple years ago, here is the technology that Azure was using for data centers. Uh, data centers are shipping containers in a parking lot. Uh, chilled water going in, electricity going in, internet going in, otherwise sealed. Uh, and line, line up shipping containers in a parking lot. Roof and walls are optional. They're only there if you need them for security. So compare that with whatever you're doing for data centers, and I guarantee they will be cheaper. So the cloud is going to be wildly cheaper. Uh, that isn't necessarily true today, but uh, competition is going to uh, send, send cloud prices. Uh, it'll be a race to the bottom, and they will be cheaper than you are either now or in the near future. So you should be planning on moving decision support to the cloud as aggressively as you can. Uh, and so that's just economics. The other really nice thing is that uh, the the, on the cloud, it turns out that uh, elasticity is possible, which is on a query by query basis, you can decide to allocate five nodes or 500 nodes or 5,000 nodes. So you can elastically configure the resources that you're applying to your problem uh, on a query by query basis. Uh, that's true for Snowflake right now and all the other vendors are moving aggressively in this direction. So not only do you get cheaper prices, but you get uh, resource elasticity. So the cloud is inevitable, so get going on it. But you've got to be a little bit smart. So just for example, uh, Amazon Web Services plays by a different set of rules. First of all, uh, you can use storage from a thing called S3, which is a distributed file system. You can also uh, store stuff in the enterprise block store, EBS. S3 has a dramatic pricing advantage relative to EBS. Uh, that pricing advantage has nothing to do with the cost of resources. It's completely artificial. This is simply uh, AWS's uh, business model. Uh, another thing you have to keep in mind is that the house solutions, uh, you know, their software is favored over third-party software for all kinds of subtle and not so subtle reasons. So just keep that in mind. And then the other thing that's really uh, an issue you'll have to deal with 
is resources come in uh, at least 50 different bundles, which are usually called t-shirt sizes. You have to decide which of 50 t-shirt sizes you want to apply uh, to your problem. So cloud architecture is going to be a problem, which is how to use cloud services uh, as economically as possible. So get going on moving to the cloud. So that was the first disruptor. Now the second disruptor, which is going to be even more significant, is the data warehouses are yesterday's issue. So what's guaranteed to happen is that data science will supersede business intelligence. So business intelligence is data warehouse stuff, business objects, uh, you know, all of that, all of those kind of apps, which are nice front ends on the front of SQL that allow you to run uh, SQL decision support queries. So data science is going to take over. So data scientists will replace business analysts as soon as you guys, enterprises, can hire enough competent data scientists. So why is that gonna happen? Well, here's the reason. So in the 2007 hurricane season, uh, there were four hurricanes in Florida. So if you're a business analyst, you would run a query like, well, uh, tell me what sold in the week before the hurricane, tell me what sold in the week after the hurricane by department, uh, and compare that with same sales stores in, same, same store sales in Georgia, and that will give you a huge uh, table of numbers. So that's what, a, that's what a business analyst will give you, is a huge table of numbers. If you give the same problem to a data scientist, he will probably say, let me build you a predictive model that will predict sales of items by department uh, for a hurricane. So which would you rather have, a predictive model that you can then present what-if scenarios to, or a big table of numbers? I guarantee you that you'd rather have a predictive model. So predictive models are going to replace uh, simple uh, tables of numbers as soon as you guys can hi hire enough data scientists, which is as soon as uh, universities can uh, churn out data scientists with the requisite uh, skills. So what exactly is data science? Uh, well, the first thing, which, which is everyone's favorite thing to talk about right now, is machine learning. So machine learning is one of two things. It either is deep learning, so-called, uh, you know, so-called neural networks. So you can apply neural networks uh, to some problems. And the famous example is uh, Google using a deep learning network to find pictures of cats on the internet. You've probably all seen that demo. So there's deep learning, which is using a neural network. Uh, the second thing is there's conventional machine learning, which has been around for 30 years. And that's things like uh, Bayesian networks, things like discrimination networks, and so forth. Uh, and so you can run one of two technologies. I just want to remind you that deep learning is not going to take over the world. Uh, there are two big reasons why that's not going to happen. First of all, they require way too much training data for a lot of applications. So millions and millions of pieces of training data are required to train a deep learning model. and Conventional machine learning takes a lot less training data. Uh, second thing is explainability, which is if you have to explain why you did something, uh, if you have deep learning, you know, you point at this black box and say, oh, I don't know what happened. The, you know, this, this thing I don't understand said that you get, a, you, you get your loan denied. Uh, with conventional machine learning, you have a better chance at, at giving some explanation as to what went wrong. So explainability and training data 
will keep deep learning out of a lot of enterprise structured data applications. So anyway, both will both there will be both uh, used in a wide variety of applications. It behooves you to get smart on who's good at what. Second thing data science means is a lot of fancy data analytics. Uh, so singular value decomposition, logistic request, re regression, linear regression, and so forth. Uh, none of these can be expressed in SQL. These are all linear algebra on arrays. So uh, this stuff has been uh, known for years. Uh, and the thing for you to keep in mind is that it's not SQL. Now, the third thing data science will mean is whatever your marketing department comes up with. So uh, marketeers are great at uh, fudding the truth. And so if you don't have either the first case or the second case, your marketing department will say you're doing machine learning anyway, but you mean something else entirely. So the next thing is, okay, so what exactly uh, is conventional machine learning, deep learning, and uh, non-SQL analytics? So it's all complex math operations. And if you wanna think of it as the world of the quants and the rocket scientists, that's fine with me. And the blue thing is the thing that's most significant which is most of this stuff is specified as linear algebra on array data. So uh, complex math operations are sequences of linear algebra operations on array data. So you open up uh, the, these linear algebra sequences and there's a small subset of inner loops. Matrix multiply is a popular one. Singular value decomposition is another one. Linear regression is another one. And these inner loops get highly optimized and they're run on CPUs or GPUs and or other hardware. The thing for you to realize is that you as a user uh, are gonna be running linear algebra codes on array data. So back up, you flip forward one slide. So back up one slide. So back up another slide. Okay, so how do you solve uh, such problems? So if you're dealing with big data, uh, big analytics, uh, what sort of tools are, are at your disposal? Uh, if you're running machine learning, uh, you can run scikit-learn, that's a popular package open source. Uh, you can run TensorFlow, uh, brought to you by Google. Both Google and Amazon have wrapped this stuff in uh, a bunch of easy to use tools. So that will help you run uh, machine learning codes, uh, either deep learning or shallow learning, uh, or conventional machine learning applications. Thing for you to keep in mind is that none of these uh, packages have data management. In other words, they don't store your data persistently and they don't give you any data management facilities. That's something you have to solve uh, using uh, some add-on. Anyway, so you can run an ML package. Next slide. So you can also run a statistics package. R is a popular one, MATLAB is a popular one, SAS is a popular one, and so forth. Uh, all of these guys have weak or non-existent SQL. So basically, uh, they give you file system storage uh, for your data and weak or non-existent uh, access to SQL. What's more, you have to be a little careful uh, R doesn't scale because it's, it assumes your data is in main memory and is not a multi-node parallel system. So scalability may be an issue in any of these packages. So you can run a stat package and what you get is something less than a complete solution. Next slide. 
okay, you can try and run a relational database system by itself. Uh, it is possible to code uh, big data analytics in SQL. Uh, Tamer tried that briefly uh, in the beginning and very quickly discarded the tactic because it's orders of magnitude too slow. So you can try this, but I, you know, the it's not likely to work. Uh, so the second thing is you can well you can try running user-defined functions, uh, which are the you know available in most SQL systems at this point. Uh, that still requires you to simulate arrays on top of relational tables, because as I mentioned, all of these codes assume array data. So you've got to, one way or another, figure out how to create arrays uh, on top of your tables. And almost all codes uh, that do uh, linear algebra require iteration. And current user-defined function modules don't support iteration. So you've got to do a whole bunch of work in the UDFs, you got to deal with simulating arrays on top of tables. And so this is a possible uh, solution, but again, it's less than terrific. Next slide. Uh, the, uh, there are a bunch of startups that are bringing array database systems to the market. Now, deep learning and conventional machine learning requires array data. So if you store your data in tables, you've got to convert it to arrays. So why not have an array database system? Sounds like a good idea. Uh, there are a bunch of startups that will give you this. They give you SQL-like operations on arrays with competitive built-in uh, algo for conventional machine learning, deep learning. These products are starting to get traction in the genomic space and we'll see how it goes uh, off into the future. So this is the new technology, if you want to put it that way. Uh, next slide. Okay, Spark is widely uh, proposed as the solution du jour. Now, Spark has SQL built in. It's called Spark SQL. However, Spark SQL is not competitive with uh, the serious SQL engines from the data warehouse vendors. Uh, Spark will also give you a streaming solution that lets you uh, take in live data. Spark streaming is also not competitive against other products. So uh, you can think of this as a least common denominator approach. However, Spark does offer you a parallel computing platform. And as long as you do your own plumbing, uh, that will work out pretty well. So Tamer, for example, uses Spark. Uh, we run our uh, conventional machine learning analytics in parallel uh, on the Spark platform. However, we, use, we do data management in HBase, which is a data management system. We do text indexing using Elasticsearch. We store our transaction data in Postgres, and we do our own plumbing, which is uh, Spark is a good parallel computing platform, and as long as you augment it with other stuff and are willing to do your own plumbing, this will work out uh, pretty well. Next slide. Now, I, I love to beat up MapReduce. Uh, MapReduce got rebranded, well, it got re-implemented by Yahoo and called Hadoop a long time ago. And so MapReduce to me is synonymous with Hadoop. Uh, MapReduce is not good for anything. Uh, MapReduce was discarded by Google, who built it, more than five years ago uh, and saying it had no place in their platform going forward. Uh, they stopped using MapReduce for the application, namely crawling the crawling the internet to build their search structures. They discarded that more than five years ago. So this was the application for which MapReduce was custom built. Google threw it away a long time ago. So MapReduce is good for nothing. Uh, don't even think about it. 
So that left the, the Hadoop vendors with a big problem, which is the thing that they were selling was had been widely figured out to not be good for anything. So Cloudera and Hortonworks and the other guys uh, quickly rebranded Hadoop as something totally different, which is it's now HDFS, which is a parallel file system plus a bunch of other stuff. So Hadoop is now whatever you think it is on top of a parallel file system. And when you think of a parallel file system, think of that as roughly speaking uh, Amazon AWS S3. So the cloud vendors are, are flat out competitors with HDFS uh, and have generally better and more complete offerings in this area. So I expect a lot of competition in the distributed file system space between the cloud vendors and uh, Hadoop and let the best platform win. Next slide. So there's all these solutions. Most of them are kind of immature or have a bunch of problems. So it's definitely the wild west right now so hold on to your seatbelt and pretty much you're going to be assembling solutions from piece parts for a while. Uh, I'm not expecting a complete multi-purpose scalable parallel uh, petascale solution in the immediate future. Uh, but anyway, you should watch the, the main vendors and decide uh, what you want to do. Uh, but in terms of this space, get going on getting smart at the very least. Next slide. Okay, so let's now move to big velocity. So that is your data is coming at you too fast. And there are applications where the velocity of data is going up. So sensor tagging everything of value sends velocity through the roof. So there are a whole bunch of vendors who are saying, put a gizmo on your cell phone and I will adjust your insurance rates depending on how you drive and where you drive. And they are reporting uh, your position and other aspects of your car uh, 20 or 30 times a second. Sense velocity through the roof. Uh, a lot of this technology gets deployed on smartphones, uh, so it will all become omnipresent and available in lots of applications. And again, it sends velocity through the roof. Uh, the state of multiplayer internet games must be recorded. So Fortnite and uh, the other guys that uh, have popular internet games sends velocity through the roof. So there are a bunch of applications that are raising velocity a whole bunch. Next slide. So in the commercial marketplace, there's two different velocity solutions. The first one is I've got a big pattern, but I don't have a whole lot of state. So electronic trading is, is an exemplar of this, which is you all watch the ticker tape on CNBC, which shows trades going across your screen. Uh, basically, the electronic trading guys watch this ticker tape and are looking for patterns in this ticker tape. So find me a strawberry followed within 100 milliseconds by a banana. So there are a bunch of mature products that do complex event processing, of which electronic trading is an exemplar look for pattern in a fire hose. And so CEP is the first class of products. Uh, they're available from a bunch of vendors, from TIBCO is one of the popular ones and so forth. Next slide. The other, okay, so in the CEP world, uh, there's offerings from TIBCO, Kafka is a popular one and so forth. It's a pretty mature marketplace at this point, very high performance. And the only question you have to ask yourself 
is what exactly exact transaction model do you want? Which is if you're if you're streaming data in and you get a service interruption, what do you want to happen? Well, you can replay your stream perhaps with some delay. And so the last thing anyone wants to do is process an incoming message more than once, uh, but you want to process it at least once. So exactly once semantics to be sure, but the various vendors have various failure models of what to do when there's a crash. Yeah, I've got to stop for a second. My wife just, no, okay. She turned on the TV and then turned it off. Okay, so if you've got uh, the other of the two cases, which is uh, you've got a lot of state and pattern isn't very important. So it turns out there's an electronic trading example that exemplifies this. So one of the, the uh, big electronic trading companies is called Getco. They have, uh, a while ago, they accounted for 10% of the volume on the New York Stock Exchange. So they have electronic trading desks all over the world. Think Tokyo, New York, London, so forth. So every one of them is trading independently. So the CFO of Getco wants to assemble the worldwide real-time global position of all of these electronic trading platforms <clears throat> for or against every stock that they're trading, think uh, 30,000 or so, and then alert me if my exposure gets too high. Because if all of these engines are all shorting IBM at the same time, your exposure just is too large. So what you want to do is accept all the trading uh, actions from all of these electronic platforms all over the world and uh, assemble your real-time position, that's millisecond by millisecond, for or against every stock and then have a trigger that alerts the CFO if uh, your exposure gets too high. This looks like high performance OLTP. So this is the second kind of product uh, and use case uh, that high velocity uh, entails. Next slide. So if you want to, if you have a high performance OLTP issue, then how are you going to solve it? So the first thing is run the traditional uh, relational database systems, uh, the Oracle's uh, SQL servers uh, of the world. And I can tell you right now, don't bother. Uh, they are way too slow uh, to deal with uh, Getco's application. So if you want to process uh, hundreds of thousands of messages a second, don't even try it with the traditional relational database vendors. They are way too slow. Uh, instead of telling you all the reasons why, uh, just go read uh, a popular paper from more than a decade ago, which was written by me and a bunch of other folks, called Through the OLTP Looking Glass and What We Found There. So if you want to run Oracle, uh, you want to run SQL Server, uh, don't. Next slide. Second thing is people proposed, well, why don't we run NoSQL? Now, it used to mean, NoSQL used to mean, I don't want SQL, I want something else. Uh, then it kind of got marketing morphed into NoSQL meant not only SQL, which is SQL was fine for some applications, but NoSQL, uh, no, not SQL was uh, what you wanted for some other applications. Uh, NoSQL, in, in my opinion today, means not yet SQL. So what's this all about? So the NoSQL vendors traditionally said, uh, you want to give up SQL. SQL is too slow, so we're going to ask you to implement uh, actions in a lower level uh, language. And the relational database guys look at this and say, uh, you guys want to go back to Codasil and IMS 
from the 1970s, which is the way to specify interactions with a database is in a high-level declarative language, not by coding a bunch of low-level storage uh, directives. So it's interesting to note that Cassandra and Mongo, which are popular products in the NoSQL space, uh, are realizing that users do not want to code these low-level utterances and are moving to, yep, SQL. Uh, they don't quite call it SQL, but unless you squint, it's basically SQL. Second thing they say is that you got to give up on ACID, give up on transactions. Uh, transactions are just too slow. Now, I just want to caution you that if you need ACID and, and your database system doesn't give it to you, you are toast. Uh, it's a decision to tear your hair out uh, by having to do it yourself. And if you give up ACID now, can you guarantee that you won't need it tomorrow? So I think giving up on ACID is a dangerous, dangerous thing to do. And in fact, the most recent uh, release of Mongo is starting to add transactions into Mongo. Next slide. Okay, the third option is what's come to be called New SQL, uh, which is uh, run a database system that keeps transactions and keeps SQL, but goes fast. That means use main memory, don't use, don't use uh, disk storage and use a different uh, transaction implementation other than the one used by the elephants uh, because the elephants transactions are too slow, their buffer pool, disk buffer pool is too slow. Their, implement, their implementations are totally flawed to go fast, but the basic idea behind uh, transactions in SQL are good ones. So there are products from I, from Microsoft that do this. IBM has a product, VoltDB, MemSQL. So there's a bunch of uh, products that uh, will use new SQL and uh, they run millions of transactions a second. So I have not seen an application yet that overruns complex event processing software or the good new SQL implementations. So there's no gorilla here, which is if you need to go fast and you've got a CEP application, run a good CEP product. If you've got a, uh, if you've got a high performance OLTP application, run a new, run new SQL. Uh, so I think, you know, there's no gorilla here. There's just, you have to intelligently choose your product. So that leads us to the third V, which is big variety. This is the 800 pound gorilla. This is what you should have your smartest people focus on. So what is the big variety all about? I just wanna give you two quick scenarios. The first one it has to do with data scientists. The second one has to do with data integration. Next slide. So I've talked recently with uh, the chief data officer of Merck, and he has a thousand or so data scientists. Uh, each one comes up with ideas, like does row gain cause weight gain in mice? So his data scientists must find relevant data that might help answer that question. Now Merck has 4,000 or so Oracle databases, plus a big data lake, plus uncountable files, and they're interested in data off the public web. And they are tearing their hair out doing data integration to get the data together that they can then analyze for the pro project they have in hand. Uh, my best vignette is a data scientist uh, at iRobot. iRobot is the guys who have the automatic vacuum cleaner that runs around your living room. Uh, the iRobot lady said, I spend 90% of my time finding and cleaning the data that I want to analyze. And then I spend 90% of the remaining 10% fixing my data cleaning errors. So she spends 99% of her time doing data munging, data integration, data integration, data cleaning. 
So data scientists don't do data science, they do data integration. So the fallacy is when you hire a data scientist, you're asking for somebody who's very good at analytics, but that's not what any of them do. They spend the overwhelming majority of their time doing data integration. No one I've talked to quotes a number less than 80% of their work week is spent doing data integration. So data science is, is about data integration, not about data science. Next slide. Okay, here's an enterprise problem, which I love. So General Electric turns out to have 75 procurement systems. Now you can all tell me that the ideal number of procurement systems is one. So what is a procurement system? Well, if you wanna buy some paper clips, you go to your procurement system, you type in a, uh, a, an account to charge to, and it spits out a purchase order, which you can take down to Staples and get your paper clips. So ideal in enterprise has one. If you work for a you know, well-run enterprise, chances are you have a very small number of procurement systems. GE has 75. Why do they have 75? Well, they've largely grown by acquiring other companies and companies come with a procurement system and unless you aggressively stamp them out, you get a bunch of them. So the GE CFO estimates that GE can save $100 million a year if it just does the following. Each of the 75 procurement officers, uh, if when their contract with Staples comes up for renewal, if they can find what the other 74 of their counterparts negotiated in terms of uh, terms and conditions, and then they demand most favored nation status. So if GE can do this, which is just demand most favored nation status among the other GE's uh, GE procurement systems, that would save 75, they would save $100 million a year. That requires integrating 75 independently constructed supplier databases. So you gotta find all the various different uh, instances of staples, however they're called and whatever their address is, and then find out their terms and conditions. Now you might say, well, isn't, isn't this just a matter of finding staples and a few other office supply guys? No, uh, GE is already pretty good at uh, doing the very, very popular uh, supplier issues. This is all in the long tail. So you've got to do the long tail, which requires you to do the serious data integration. So GE wants to integrate suppliers. They also want to integrate parts. They want to integrate customers. They want to integrate lab data. Most enterprises want to do that what's called data mastering of all of these popular kinds of things. So GE can save a lot of money by solving their data integration problems. Next slide. In either case, either data science or uh, enterprise data, uh, for each data source, you've got to go out, ingest the source, figure out what it is, uh, move it into your data lake or wherever you're going to do this uh, data integration, perform transformations because in Europe it's in euros, in the US it's in dollars, you gotta clean your data because a rule of thumb is that 10% of your data is wrong or missing. And if you do analytics on dirty data, you're gonna get garbage. You gotta do schema integration, which is your wages is the same as my salary. Uh, you gotta do GE's problem, which is deduplicate uh, the various, uh, various records so you find all the staples. Uh, as often as not, once you get a cluster of proposed duplicates, you know, for instance, staples, you want to find a golden record to go with staples, which is all the other uh, attributes that go with a deduplicated de uh, database. So that's what you have to do. Next slide. And that's what, uh, and that's what data scientists are spending all of their time doing. Now, the other thing that's a, a big killer is that you've got to do this at scale. 
So GE, among these 75 databases of suppliers, has about 10 million uh, raw supplier records. So that's what you're trying to uh, integrate. Uh, Toyota Motor Europe, which is a Tamer customer, wants to integrate customer data across all of Europe. Why do they want to do this? Well, if you buy a Toyota in Spain and you move to France, uh, Toyota Motor France has no idea who you are because the Spanish guys are independent from the French guys. So Toyota is in the process of building a Europe-wide database of customers so that they can do better customer support. There's about 30 million of them. So they got to do this at scale. So do not even think about uh, running naive algorithms on your laptop in Python. At scale, this is serious business. Next slide. So here's the traditional solution. This is brought to you by Informatica, IBM, uh, the elephants, the traditional vendors. They say run an extract, transform, and load package, an ETL system. And once you get done doing that, then run master data management. And uh, the traditional solution is an ETL and an MDM. So ETL is flawed. Uh, it requires too much manual programming effort uh, because what you do is you send a programmer out to understand each local data source, figure out what's in it, and figure out how to, how to construct a pipeline of transformation steps that will transform it uh, into a global schema and by the way you have to have constructed the global schema up front and that's really difficult to do at scale second thing is that etl is architected wrong because if you come across uh, merck and you're in europe and uh, you're trying to figure out is this is this the same as merck in italy well you the programmer has no idea and only a domain expert uh, knows how to, you know, what's a duplicate and what's not. And so just having a programmer do the whole pipeline uh, is simply flawed because he is incapable of making these domain decisions that are required to be made. Uh, so ETL is flawed uh, and MDM doesn't scale. So the next slide tells you why MDM doesn't scale. So once you have done ETL, you've put all of your data together. Now you've got to deduplicate it. You've got to solve the staples problem. And that's called matching uh, in the MDM lingo. And as often as not, you've then got to find golden records, which is do a merge uh, of the clusters of things you think are the same. All the popular MDM products do this with rules. So a rule can be, well, if you have, if you have uh, two records and they have the same company name, regardless of what the address is, they're probably the same. So, those the, so you start writing some rules. And it's simply well known that a human can grok about 500 rules. After that, the complexity just overwhelms you and you can't figure out what's going on. So you can do MDM up to about 500 rules, and then it just won't scale further. So GE had a classification problem they asked Tamer to help them with. Uh, they had a bunch of spend records. And the spend record is I took a taxi from over here to Logan Airport, and I charged the company uh, 30 bucks for that ride. So that would be a spend record. So GE wanted to classify 20 million of them into a pre-existing hierarchy, which is they spend money on things. One of the things they spend money on is travel. A piece of travel is taxi and so forth. So they had a pre-existing classification hierarchy and they just wanted to classify uh, 20 million spend records. So they said, well, the traditional vendors said, do this with MDM. So they started writing rules and they wrote about 500 rules and that classified 2 million of the 20 million transactions. 
Now they at that point realized that they could not run five, they could not write 5,000 or 10,000 rules. So they could not scale, they could not scale the problem, uh, the solution to the size of the problem they had. So what, what about the other 18 million? Next slide. So they asked Tamer for help. And so what did Tamer do? Well, Tamer has a machine learning system that does schema integration, deduplication, and golden value resolution. We used the 500 rules that they'd written, the result of that as training data for a machine learning model, which classified the other 18 million transactions. So at scale, you've got to use ML. You cannot use a rule system. It just isn't going to work. Next slide. So what's happening in, in the big variety space? Well, this is an 800 pound gorilla. It's killing most of you. Uh, there's a whole bunch of startups in this space. Some oriented toward data preparation. That means extract, transform, and load. A few are focused on enterprise data integration. Those are usually the traditional vendors selling rule systems that aren't going to scale. Some of them are focused on text. Some are focused on deep learning. This is the wild, wild west. Hold on to your seatbelt. But the thing to remember is that this is what's killing you. It's not big for big volume and it's not big velocity. Next slide. So just a summary. Uh, machine learning will be omnipresent off into the future. Uh, big data, big analytics uh, that are not machine learning will be popular. Uh, you, you'll use some conventional machine learning, some deep learning, and some other analytic techniques. You're going to be in the complex analytics data science world. That's going to replace business intelligence as soon as we can train enough data scientists to do it. Both of these things will go nowhere without good data. If you, if you put garbage into any of these models, you're going to get garbage out. Uh, and big da good data requires data integration at scale. This is the 800 pound gorilla in the corner. Put your best people on solving that. And if you want to talk to Tamer, uh, here we are. Uh, just just uh, ask Mingo how, to, how he can help you. And with that, I'll stop and turn it back over to Mingo. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for that presentation, Mike. It's really awesome hearing not just about the data variety problem that I'm sure everyone is very familiar with, but also potential ways that we can try to address that problem. Uh, now, we've received a few questions uh, around this data variety problem. And uh, just to start things off, in the past week or so, a lot of organizations have been forced to enable their entire workforce to work from a home uh, because of the coronavirus. This is having a huge impact on businesses, especially those that follow more traditional work patterns. Uh, so for those organizations, what advice would you have uh, as they're facing unplanned downtime or have had to close because of COVID-19? Uh, I <laughs> Well, you know, we're all, we're all in the same situation, and I think you know the the the, the basic answer to that question is stay safe, uh, figure out how to practice social distancing, and so stay healthy. Uh, and if you can't stay healthy, nothing else matters. Uh, past that, I think anything you can do to get leverage over your business problems, now's a great time to try and do that. And so get going on the big problems that I've discussed in this presentation, especially on, on the data variety problem. Yeah, that's great. And just as a follow-up to that, um, you've mentioned some of these big problems that companies are facing out there and how now is a great time to be going after those problems. Do you have a favorite story about an organization using data mastering to solve one of these problems? Uh, sure. So, so, uh, so I think uh, I talked. I talked about Toyota, uh, and they are mastering customers. I talked about GE, which is mastering suppliers. 
So let me talk about a company that is mastering parts. Uh, and then I will talk about a company mastering content. Uh, so Carnival, Carnival Cruise Lines, uh, the guys with the big white boat, unfortunately they are now sort of adrift at sea or, or docked with nothing, no customers on them. So anyway, Carnival Cruise Lines turns out to be nine different brands. So it, uh, Carnival has grown by acquiring companies. Uh, Holland America turns out to be owned by Carnival. Uh, Costco in Europe uh, turns out to be owned by Carnival. There's nine of them. And as you would uh, surmise, they each have their own parts depoting system. So parts are either on the boat, they're on the dock, or in the, they're in the warehouse. And so they have nine different uh, supply chains. So they, of course, say, well, you know, why can't we share parts across these various cruise lines? After all, we all use the same kind of straws. So they want to share parts uh, in, their, in these nine depoting systems. And that requires them to integrate nine different parts databases, uh, each written independently. And they are in the process of doing exactly that with Tamer's help. So parts mastering will also be a big deal so that you can make supply chains more efficient. So the, there is a uh, major uh, Hollywood studio that owns a lot of content. And whenever people use their content, they get royalties. So they get royalties from lots and lots of sources. So they have to integrate many different sources that are licensing their content. So they started doing this about 10 years ago, and they said they, they drank the traditional Kool-Aid and decided to try a rule system. And they've written 10,000 rules with two people over the course of a decade. So I figure they have put in at least $5 million, and they have a system with 10,000 rules that is unmaintainable. And to add a new data source takes them a year. So they have a Rube Goldberg that is just falling over. So they are switching to Tamer uh, to do uh, basically content uh, mastering. Uh, so the mastering is, is done in a wide variety of uh, business critical kinds of entities. That's awesome. Thank you, Mike. So we also received a few questions about data ops more broadly. Um, so going on to the next question, where do you see the future of data ops in the next 10 years? What do companies need to do in order to adapt and be successful? Okay, well, I'll, gi I'll give you an answer in the tamer context, because uh, that's the market that we, we deal with. So internally, inside Tamer, if you look at Toyota's problem or GE's problem or Carnival's problem or the problem that the major studio has, uh, the solution is a pipeline of stuff. So you've got to ingest the data. Uh, you've got to do transformations. Uh, I had a slide back a while that listed all the steps. So th this is a pipeline of operations. And what a customer needs to do is set up that pipeline. Either they do it or they ask Tamer for our, our help. And so this is a pipeline of data operations. So you can call this a pipeline of data ops. And they are going to run this, this pipeline initially to put all put all of their entities together. But then as things change, as they add new entities, delete entities, they are running this pipeline in incremental mode uh, to keep their, uh, their output correct. Uh, then they have to send this output to a downstream, typically an analytics platform of some sort. Mm -hmm. So it's a data ops platform and pipeline that's going to be run for 
a long time, years. And it's going to change over that lifetime as you add and subtract uh, new kinds of cleaning, new kinds of transformations, you add new kinds of data sources and so forth. So data ops basically says, structure your problem as a sequence of these data operations and then uh, then maintenance becomes a lot easier because you can add and drop uh, individual operations at will. So it's a very good way to think about uh, any data-oriented problems. Think of them as a pipeline of data ops. Mm -hmm. All right, well, once again, Mike, thank you so much for that presentation and going through some of this Q&A with us. And thank you to everyone who joined this webinar today. I hope this was informative and really helpful for uh, exploring the data variety problem that I'm sure so many of you are facing. If you have any additional questions or would like to learn more about Tamer or just the data problem as a whole, feel free to check out tamer.com uh, and get in touch with us to find out more. Thanks again and have a great day.